Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm good evening to you. Is the sound system on? Can you hear me okay? Very good. Uh, my name is Tim Robertson. I'm the director of the Royal Society of Literature. Uh, and it's our very great pleasure and privilege each year to hold a joint event with the Royal Society uh, in which we bring together the worlds of literature and science for a conversation uh, and often between two uh, of our fellows. And so we have Adam Nicholson, Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature uh, and Professor Tim Burkehead, uh, Fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and they are here to talk uh, on the topic of Save the Seabird, uh, which follows on particularly from Adam's uh, book, um, The... Uh, uh, the Seabird's Cry. The Seabird's Cry is a quotation from Seamus Heaney, uh, and seabirds have very much been a tradition, especially in poetry in English, uh, through Milton, uh, through Coleridge, uh, through to Seamus Heaney, Kathleen Jamie, Derek Walcott, others in our uh, era. And that uh, writing has always been in response to and in relation to scientific discovery. Uh, and so that's more of the discovery that we hope to do this evening. Uh, and to chair that discussion, we're very glad to welcome Claudia Hammond. And so I'm simply going to introduce Claudia and then hand over to her for the rest of this evening. Claudia Hammond is an award-winning broadcaster, writer, and psychology lecturer. She writes and reports regularly on psychology for the BBC, including as the presenter of All in the Mind and Mind Changes on Radio 4. She teaches health and social psychology for Boston University here in London uh, and has just finished a two-year residency at the Wellcome Collection. She's the author of three books, most recently, Mind Over Money, The Psychology of Money and How to Use It Better, published by Canon Gate. Claudia. Thanks, Tim. Um, and um, I'm thrilled to be uh, here tonight doing this. This uh, summer I was lucky enough to be one of the uh, judges of the uh, Royal Society Science Book Prize. And uh, one day there was a, a ring at the doorbell and there was a courier there with two enormous cardboard boxes. And then I realised the um, state, the size of the task I'd agreed to do in, in being a judge on this. But it was really fascinating. I, I spent many months reading them. And it made me think a lot about the purposes of the purpose of writing and the purpose of science writing, of course, was something we discussed a lot. And that, that is one of the things we will look at tonight. And we're focusing on one particular topic tonight, which is uh, seabirds and how writers and scientists can capture people's imagination when it comes to that topic. World seabird populations have reduced by a third since 1950, and the race is, is very much on to try to save them. And for that race to succeed, of course, it's essential to, to get the public on board. And, and what is the best way of doing so? And in particular, when it comes to writing, what is the best way of doing so? Um, I'm delighted that we're looking at, at birds today. I'm someone who uh, spent my childhood with a, a father who'd drive along, not looking at the road, but up in the sky, um, <laughs> insisting on identifying not just the species, but the age of each uh, bird that we passed. And we're very lucky to have uh, two brilliant writers here tonight, Tim Burkhead and Adam Nicholson. I'll introduce them more in detail um, in turn. They're going to give us a very short introduction to their work. Then I'll be having a conversation with them. Then we will open things up to the floor. So do be thinking what questions you would like to ask. Um, and we will end at about half past um, seven. So first of all, we're going to hear from um, Professor Tim Burkhead, who is a zoologist at the University of Sheffield. He studies animal behavior and how, when environments change, that can affect the behavior. Um, his research focus focuses on birds, and he's, he's very well known and renowned for some of the hugely important contributions that he's made to the field. Um, he is a fellow of the Royal Society here, but he's also the author of several popular science books, very much aimed at a general audience, two of which have been shortlisted for the Royal Society's annual book prize. So in 2012, there was a bird sense, what's it like to be a bird? And then last year, the most perfect thing inside and out a bird's egg, uh, which is, is really fascinating. So we're briefly going to hear from Tim first. Okay. <clears throat> so I've been studying uh, seabirds and guillemots um, for a long time. I started in 1972 when I had this fabulous head of hair. <laughs> and um, I've deteriorated ever since, so 91, 2012. And um, as my head of department said when he looked at this slide, he went, he's wearing the same bloody shirt. And <laughs> it's true. In 1969, I bought two work shirts from the Army and Navy stores in Leeds. 
and they're the best guillemot field working shirts you can have. They come down to your knees, so that if you have to share a room with somebody that you don't know or you don't like, it covers all your bits. And they're great for stuffing guillemot chicks down when, you, when you're ringing them. And I've worked on guillemots uh, in lots of different places, but my favourite place is this, which is Scomer Island off the coast of South Wales. And uh, as I say, I've been going back every year since 1972, and I'm just absolutely in love with this place. It's covered in wildflowers in the spring, and the cliffs are covered by, with seabirds uh, during most of that time as well. And for me, um, studying guillemots in particular is a bit like um, a health check for the environment. So our work has involved uh, colouring in birds. You can see these guillemots here are all wearing colourings. It allows us to recognise them as individuals. That allows us to record how long they survive and so on. And uh, monitoring, as it's called, is regarded as the lowest form of scientific activity. Yet, in the world that's changing as rapidly as ours is, high-quality scientific monitoring, I feel, is absolutely essential. And that's what makes me tick. And next we are going to hear from Adam Nicholson, who is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the author of many, many books on history and travel and the environment. He's won both the Somerset Maugham Award and the British Topography Prize. Um, his latest book is The Seabird's Cry. It's been published just this summer, and it has ten chapters each on a different seabird. I've been, been reading this, very, very enjoyable. And it has the ten different ones, so you're sure to find your favourite one in there. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Well, I had the benefit of, of seeing uh, Tim's slides before uh, he saw mine. And so, am I turning this on? Am I going the wrong way? Going yes, the wrong way. <laughs> Hang on. There we are. Yes, yeah, so I thought I would imitate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, there's clearly a very close correlation between um, lack of hair and seabird enthusiasm. There's a, a kind of lovely glowing pate is one thing that we share. These, these photos all taken on the islands, which are my equivalent of Skona, which are the Chantiles in the Hebrides, which my father, when he was a student, bought with some money his granny left him for £1,200. Wonderful. Uh, 500 acres of nothing very much except that one tiny house and 300,000 breeding seabirds in the summer. And so that's where my obsession came from. And a few years ago, I was in the Pharaohs, uh, uh, with a very nice man, a, a shepherd called Bjorn Patterson. We were talking about seabirds, and he said, well, which is your favourite seabird? And I said, the shearwater. I just love the way they, they do what they do. And he said, yes, yes, I couldn't agree more. They're delicious roast, aren't they? <laughs> but the, uh, here are a couple of shearwaters. The Manx shearwaters are named after, as you see on that right-hand image there, the way in which the wing just cuts into the sea like that and they've always been known as it, throughout history throughout human history or recorded literate history as the great travelers uh, hermes in the uh, odyssey is a shearwater and mercury in the aeneid is a shearwater satan in paradise lost is a shearwater these have always been known as the extraordinary uh, capable ocean travelers and this is a picture which uh, records the first great discovery about them. That, that shearwater is in the hands of a man called Ronald Lockley, who did the first great sh uh, shearwater studies on another island off the Pembrokeshire coast in Skokum. And he, Lockley, marvellous 1930 science this is, put two shearwaters in a box and sent them on the Orient Express to Venice. And in Venice the uh, British consul there, dipping them very delicately in the waters of the lagoon, just south of the Judeca, then released them. One disappeared, and one, 12 days later, Lockley found back in its burrow in Skokum. Uh, nobody knew how it got there, but it was just the most extraordinary example of these creatures having a form of understanding. You know, a way, how on earth, never been to Venice, find your way back to your burrow in Skokum, and in great condition, glossy with health, apparently. So since then, seabird scientists, I think this is the reason that I've, in a way, fallen in love with modern seabird science, have begun to investigate how these birds do what they do. And the right hand of those two maps there 
is uh, a chart of the prevailing winds in the South Atlantic uh, at this time of year. And the left-hand chart is the tracks of shearwaters from the Canaries and the Azores traveling south, migrating south for the southern summer. And you can see there is an extraordinary attuning of creature to world. And these, I think, the seabirds embody that in a really astonishing way. And these uh, charts here, if you can read them, which I hope you can, are of the most extraordinary experiment done on shearwaters uh, by uh, an Italian, Anna Gagliardi, Anna Gagliardo, a few years ago. And she took a whole load of shearwaters from uh, the Azores and on a ship went 500 miles east of the Azores. She divided it into three. Some she didn't do anything to. Some she attached a little plastic box on their heads with glue, which had little magnets in that could roll around uh, freely. So they were in a constantly changing magnetic environment. And the third group, she put a chemical in their noses so that they couldn't smell a temporary effect and released them all one by one. This is, there is no wind blowing from the Azores to where she released them. And the top left-hand chart is the uh, shear water she released that uh, had nothing done to them, the controls. And by and large, except for the pale blue person, they went straight home. The second one down here are the ones that had magnets put on their head. And they too, pretty well, flew straight home, totally unaffected in their means of navigation by having magnets. And these three here, and the scale changes, so that's 250k there, and this is 500. These are the ones that had their nostrils uh, blocked or, or disabled. And you can see that they're released, uh, they're released over here, and they wander utterly lost for weeks across the Atlantic, right up north of Portugal, totally unable to know where they are. This ex I mean, it's a cruel experiment, and maybe we might uh, talk about that in a minute. But what it revealed was that shearwaters do these extraordinary migrations, those tr that travel down to South America uh, every winter and back, by smell. They smell their way around the ocean. And when I first read that paper, I thought, these are creatures that we need to pay more attention to. The, this is a kind of form of understanding which, in a way, is greater than anything any human being could. Thank uh, you. Okay. And so why would both of you say that it's seabirds in particular that have captured your imagination rather than other birds? I mean, Adam, you even say that, you know, you describe seabird colonies as these seething masses of chaos and noise and, and, and a kind of hellishness of them and them all jostling for position and so on. Why do you, why do you love them so much? Well, I, I, um, I went uh, for a walk at home uh, in Kent a few years ago with a, uh, an ornithologist from uh, South Africa very beautiful, lovely part of England, and waiting for her to say um, how beautiful this was. And she didn't say anything. So after a while, I said, well, what do you think? And she said, there's nothing here. Where is everything? Where are the birds? You know, where, where is the life that should be here? This has been eviscerated. But if you go to a seabird colony, that kind of pumping fullness, the sort of total presence of life, a life undiminished, is what you get there. And I think that's why I fell in love with them. Tim, what would you say? To exactly that? the same. I mean, throbbing with, with life, and it's, it attacks all your senses. You know, the smell of a seabird colony is unforgettable. Delicious. <laughs> Ye years ago, I picked up a, a leech's petrel that had be, I found dead in a burrow. It had been mummified. This was in Labrador. I kept it in my office for 20 years. And when I was having a bad day, I'd just have to sniff it. And <laughs> this, the leech, it's a leech's petrol, and they smell exquisite, musky smell. I was transported back, you know. For t 10 minutes, I was back on the islands in Labrador. And it's also that just the sheer abundance that is missing pretty well from everywhere else in the countryside. 
And although it looks like chaos, seabird colonies are actually fairly uh, well structured and you know, it looks like chaos, but it isn't. And in your writing, Tim, are you trying to change people's views of birds or do you think there are already people, uh, people who read your books, are they people who already love birds and that's why they're reading them? I think obviously the, the people that buy them are bird watchers and interested in ornithology, but I am also trying to change their readers' appreciation of birds and, and recognise how valuable they are as a resource. And we shouldn't let numbers dwindle away because we want to overfish sand eels or we want to um, have oil and, and that's polluting the waters and so on. Um, so it is about making them appreciate birds better. So did you set out to write the books in order to campaign, if you like? Um, yes. I mean, per particularly bird sense. I mean, much as you've just said, Adam, I mean, we just underestimate what animals can do. And so that was the, a large part of the motivation for that particular book. With the book on eggs, it was slightly different. Uh, there's this deep-seated repugnance to do with birds' eggs, you know, because it's illegal to, um, to collect them, which is quite right. But as a result of that, people have this complete blind spot. Oh, and one of my academic colleague's wife said, I'm going to buy this book for my husband, but I'm not going to read it because I hate anything to do with birds' eggs. And that's, that's actually why I wrote it, to try to break that. You know, just because it's illegal to, to collect birds' eggs today doesn't mean to say we should just ignore them or pretend that they don't exist. And Adam, what about you? Was the motivation for you to, to campaign in the same way, particularly with seabirds' cries? It, you, know, you say that in, in that book only the gannets number is increasing and all the others are decreasing. Yes, I mean, the, I decided to write the book when I realised that there was something wrong. Uh, you know, I'd always assumed this massive presence was a given fact, that that's how things were. And it was always a kind of treasured little reservoir in my mind of the good. And when I started to read the papers that people like Tim had been writing, describing this appalling global destruction that's been going on, I mean, you say a third, there are, there are some papers which say that two thirds of the number of seabirds have declined in the last 50 years. You know, maybe about one and a half billion in the 50s, maybe 500 million now. And it's part, of course, of that larger picture of the destruction of, of life on Earth, in, you know, which is going on at the moment. But I thought, you know, just to say, just to alert people, because it's, it's shocking how little people do know, say, come on, this is something valuable not as a resource, you use yeah. the word resource, interestingly. I don't think of it as a resource, but it is a miraculous phenomenon which we shouldn't preside over the destruction of. And did you have to try to find different ways to draw the reader into each of your 10 chapters? You, know, you, you presumably want them to love each of those 10 birds. Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, what writing this kind of book is about. And certainly the great driver and motor inside it is discovering the science, discovering the things that people have found out about those navigational abilities, the whole, you know, mind structure that, that Tim's fantastic bird sense book is about, that just to somehow set those sensibilities alongside ours, whereas the habitual attitude to it all is that they are stupid, you know, those gannet relations in the, uh, in the Southern Seas are all called boobies because people think they're idiotic or thought they're idiotic. It is the very, very opposite of that. And I think there needs to be some giant transformation. I was thinking it's, it's like it's almost a Copernican revolution about this, you know, that we have been so man-centred in, in our view of these things, just as we always thought before Copernicus the Earth was the centre of the universe. And I think there does need to be some enormous change which says, no, that there is an equivalence across this field. They are as brilliant as us. That's, that's my motive, really. Now, Tim, egg, eggs weren't something, I had to admit, I thought a lot about until, until reading your book. But actually, you raise so many questions about egg shells and their, their shape and their, their purpose and, and how they manage to achieve what they need to achieve that I, I couldn't help but wonder about them and, and keep wondering about them. Is that your aim when you're writing? You're trying to make people think about things they haven't thought about before? Because I'm an academic at a university, I'm basically an educator as well as a researcher. 
And so you know, I do my best to inspire undergraduates. And I see writing as just a, an extension of that in a way that goes beyond undergraduates into the kind of public. So it is about uh, increasing awareness and making people excited. I'm excited about it. Uh, I just want to share that enthusiasm. And, you know, as you just hinted, one of the reviewers of that book said, I never realised eggs were so interesting. I thought, right, you know, I've, I've succeeded there. So they are, absolutely. Also, kind of miracles of biology as well. I mean, just the way they've evolved into the different shapes and the colours is a constant sort of amazement for me. And you, des you describe some of the fascinating experiments you do with you've done with eggs. Can you tell us about, about some of those and with the shells? Yeah. Okay, so because I'm, I've been working mainly on guillemots, I've been fascinated by the guillemots pear-shaped egg for many, many years. And uh, if you ask, as we could ask the audience here, why, why are guillemot eggs pear-shaped? And 90% of people say, well, it's a so it'll spin on its axis. That is complete bullshit. It, does, it really doesn't. That idea was... Dis Technical term. <laughs> that scientific term was... Dis <laughs> yeah. that, that, that idea was dismissed 150 years ago, and it was based on an egg collector who had an empty shell. And he said, well, you know, you can do this, and you spin it, and of course it will. But if an egg that's full of yolk or an embryo doesn't do that because it's too heavy. So the other idea was that the... OK, well, that uh, slightly pointed shape would allow the egg to rotate in an arc. And so it does on a very smooth surface. I've never yet seen a smooth guillemot ledge. Um, but in fact, when it does rotate in an arc, the radius is about, uh, is about this big, but most guillemot ledges are about this big. So that doesn't work either. So I've been intrigued and trying to design, well, trying to come up with hypotheses, other hypotheses for why the egg might be that shaped, and then trying as a scientist to test those to, to verify whether my hypothesis and, is correct. And, and, uh, and you have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm not telling you yet. Okay. Because, you know, because, well, we have, I can tell you two of the three hypotheses because they they're in the book. One is that that shape confers a particular strength to the egg because the guillemot sits on it. So imagine, I could have brought a, a dummy egg, but the guillemot sits on it like this. Mm. And the risk for a guillemot is that another guillemot will land on top of it. And I think that that wedge shape probably does it's confer strong. some strength. Mm. It's strong. The other idea is that being shaped like that, uh, the pointed end is in contact with the ledge, and the ledge is covered in feces, as a technical term, just bird shit. You know, the guillemot ledges are disgusting because they just defecate everywhere. But by having an egg of that shape, it keeps the big end out of the muck. And that's the end through which the chick mainly breathes. So that's, those are two hypotheses. There's, there's a bit of evidence for both of those. But I'm currently working on a third Why idea. Why are you keeping that from us now? Because, All these good people have come. Because are you waiting to publish it? <laughs> I'm, wait, I'm waiting to publish it. And if somebody here was a reporter and published it, then the scientific journal won't accept it because it's exactly. already out in the public sphere. So journals like Nature and so on embargo information until mm -hmm. it's published. So watch this space. <laughs> How long have we got to wait until you no, publish next, that? Next year. I'm, I'm, next year. I'm, I'm oh, writing okay. the manuscript. Okay. And you come at this from very opposite perspectives. So you're writing about the science, but from a writer's perspective, and you're a scientist who's then embarking on writing, if you like. So you kind of come the opposite ways. Adam, do you think you would have enjoyed doing these sorts of experiments yourself? Would you, would you like to be a scientist if you well, had I've, the time I again? Well, I'm not a scientist, but I have been with scientists doing it. And my God, it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sit there for a very, very long time counting, essentially. It's counting. As far as I can tell, it's counting. And I did it, I did it on the chance with um, someone, uh, Mike Brook, the great uh, curator of the Cambridge Museum, marvellous man. And we all counted and we got things very, very different. So I said to him, what, you know, what's this about? And he said, well, these were counting puffins. And he said, well, essentially, if you count four, there are probably either two or eight. <laughs> and we can't hope for better than that. And so it's a very interesting thing that that, that level of uncertainty in reality gets very filtered out when you come to read the papers in the journals. There is an air of conviction and certainty which is you know, required, maybe, by that form. And so there does seem to be some loss of actuality, in fact, in the scientific writing of science. And that's, uh, that I would say that one of the, 
you know, if there is a service to be done by someone like me wandering into this world, it is, I can say things like that. And I can say, talk, you know, you would never talk about shitty guillemot ledges in nature, I don't think, no, would you? No, Maybe you no, would, actually. No, no, no. Uh, and so, so there is a kind of normalisation possible from a non-scientist coming into the world of science, and I think perhaps that is worth having. So, Tim, is there too much certainty among scientists? Aren't they always questioning? This is a, a big, mm. big issue because uh, science has been made by the government so competitive that uh, a lot of people who would generally like to be very honest about things are almost obliged to impose that certainty in order to get the, their paper into a high-quality journal. Song. Are you uh, really saying that? Absolutely. I mean, uh, impose it? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. that is a terrifying thing to say. Because that is a distortion. It, it but isn't is. that then the journal's fault for well, no, because insisting they, because, on certainty? No, because every, everything's ranked in some kind of way. They're all competing. And occasionally, this is going to sound very self-righteous, but occasionally I'll say to my students, just write it as it is. And what I say to them is, we've done this study. We haven't answered the question completely, but we've done it to the best of our ability, and we've done it better than anybody else. And I think that this takes us forward. And most journals go, you can't write that. Just spin it so that it looks a bit more positive. But just occasionally, you get a couple of referees that go, I really like this honesty, and it gets published. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what motivates me. I just feel as I'm battling against the education system and the ranking of journals that impose all that nonsense on us. Because unless you're scrupulously honest as a scientist, then it all just becomes a game. And I've had, I've had students that go, it's a game. Just write it, just a game. And I hate that, absolutely hate it. So, I mean, what I try to do in, in my books is try to do, well, basically what you're doing is expose science for what it really is with all its warts and so on. And you say something about the process of, of how to yeah. do it. And would you yeah. agree it's boring sometimes? <laughs> it, well, the, the, uh, the, famous the, phrase, the famous phrase is 95% um, perspiration, 5% inspiration. And that's true, but as a scientist... You, you go into it knowing that because the 5%, that's the hit. That's, that's what you do it for. And you know that by working towards that goal, if, if it all goes well, then you will be successful. Now, how, how tempting is it when you're trying to get us to identify with uh, the different seabirds and to uh, take notice of them and realise why it's important to save their habitats and, and to protect them? Um, how tempting is it to anthropomorphise those birds in order to, and to romanticise them in order to make it so we can identify with them. Adam, what, what would you say? Well, I think that, you know, old-fashioned anthropomorphization, if that's a horrible word, is um, clearly wrong and stupid. You know, that a few years ago, the BBC made a film called, about puffins called Clowns of the Air. And I thought, how, you know, how, how wicked that is. I mean, Puffins are really more like Colonel Gaddafi than like Clowns of the Air. Uh, and so it's obviously wrong in one way. But in another way, the idea that anthropomorphization is so wicked that you should completely shut empathy out of your relationship with these creatures is also wrong. You know, that is this famous... Cartesian experiment in the 17th century where Descartes had the, had the heart of a living dog open so that he could feel its, its heart muscle opening and closing on his thumb. And his followers saying, you know, if you hit a dog and it cried, that was no more than a, a, a badly oiled machine. You know, clearly the sort of... The sense, just treating these things as machines is wrong. And so there's, there's a third term here, which is what, in fact, we've been talking about in a way, which is not thinking they have human sensibilities or they're funny or sweet, but, my God, they have sensibilities. And it's, and it's that third thing. That's the beautiful girl, I think. But you do talk about, you talk about Guillemots having extramarital affairs. He talks which about is very, that. Very it's human. all taken from his papers. <laughs> <laughs> Is it your he fault? He talks it's about what Guillemot wives. So you both do it. it <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, the, the subject known as sperm competition, which is about female promiscuity and male promiscuity, that's been my bread and butter for 40 years. So scoma's been a kind of... That's a disgusting idea. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know it's, it's, it's... But it's the phrasing, isn't it? It's whether you talk about affairs or not, no, or I, just I whether never, they're monogamous or not. I never talk about affairs. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I, it's a very n narrow mm. line between making it into twaddle and keeping it scientific. But at the same time, as you say, you have to engage mm. your uh, undergraduates or your readers. And so I think uh, carefully measured anthropomorphism can work quite well. So I... I give a talk on Guillemots and Skomer and say, you know, in the past, I would never have dared to be anthropomorphic, but I'm now going to tell you why I love Guillemots and show a picture of them breeding at high density, and there are pictures of people breeding at high density in high-rise flats. They're long-lived, they have long-term pair, pair bonds, just like people, and like people, they have extramarital affairs. And I think that engages mm. people with them. It's like penguins, isn't it? People love penguins because they think they're monogamous for life, but then scientists tell you they're not, they're not. and it's all very yeah. disappointing. But... It's only disappointing if you impose your values on those birds. Yeah, because we want them to be in love and they wait for them to come back from the sea and it's lovely. Well, there's a bit of that going on as well. Mm. And those, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about seabirds are these long-term pair bonds. Albatrosses might breed together for 40 or 50 years. We, uh, my oldest guillemots on Skoma are 40 next year. And they've been paired to the same partner all my, the time. My, notice that term. My. Yeah, they are. They're Quite mine. interesting. They're, they're my guillemots. <laughs> Why are they your guillemots? Because I put the rings on them that allowed me to identify them as individuals. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, people can come and look at them, but they're mine. No, no. <laughs> and understanding the nature of those pair bonds and how they maintain, I think, is one of the most outstanding questions in behavioural biology. So in the past. When people saw something like allopreening or um, a greeting display, they'd say, well, it's just to maintain the pair bond. And you'd say, tell me exactly what you mean by that. And they, can't, they don't know what they mean by it. Nobody really knows what they mean by it. So I, th I see that as a big challenge. And although I've studied guillemots, Mark guillemots, for all this time, I still don't know how they form those pair bonds. I mean, there is something more to say about this, which is a famous saying of, um, you know, Levi Strauss is saying that animals are good to think with, that animals have always provided a kind of, um, you know, grammar and vocabulary with which to understand lambs and lions and hawks and doves and so on. And so I think to just remove that... Uh, metaphorical sort of presence around these birds is to sort of sterilize the relationship and in fact it's you know it's deep and multiple and complex this thing about of course you can look at them just uh, purely analytically or, or purely recordingly but it doesn't uh, diminish that also to look at them as kind of miracles of being you know the two can totally happily sit alongside each other. And that's the virtue of, of what you're doing in writing these popular books. You know, I hate people, that term too. If people are attributing human emotions to them, then isn't that going a step too far? It's going beyond the science, isn't it? No, but that, I mean, that's what I, I said earlier. You don't want to sort of impute human motive and human experience to them. But you, nor should you cut yourself out from thinking these things are experiencing stress, joy, love, hate, uh, fear, um, desire, you know, I mean, there are any number of experiences that can be measured, you know, you can measure stress uh, hormone levels in the blood of these creatures, can't you? You know, and you can see from that exactly how they are feeling in relation to their environment and so on. So I think that's what's very exciting about this modern science, that it's not, you know, a, it is to do with this individualization of the creature, that if earlier science was about the trend in the graph, the current science seems to be about the dots around the trend. You know, how, why is it that I just read a paper uh, yesterday about uh, southern fulmers in the Antarctic, in which some just totally go for it, you have tons of babies, you know, feed them incredibly hard and die young. Others are incredibly prudent, sort of bank manager formers, who just sort of <laughs> said, no, we're going to go much more carefully. I don't think I'll quite look after that, that chick quite as, as well as the other one, and so on. And so there's an incredible there's a necessary variability, uh, as there is you know, in any human gathering, 
which has its own survival function, doesn't it? If you have a variable population, then it's going to be much more resilient in difficulty and so on. And so that, that is what is very rich about what's going on at the moment. And it's all it's largely driven by you know, the years of atten boring attention that Tim has been doing you know, in SCOMA and the incredible modern technology. Do you ever see examples, Tim, where it does go too far towards that size, <coughs> that side, and, and away from the science in terms of, I mean, can birds, can sea birds feel love? Uh, well, I, I have come to believe that it probably can. So one yeah. of the most, the, the event that happened during my PhD years, which inspired bird sense, I was sitting in this hide in a cleft in the rock. It was my favorite place. I was this close to the guillemots behind a, a sheet of canvas with tiny window. And uh, the birds were all going about their business. They breed very densely and make very noisy, very smelly. And suddenly this female that had been incubating stood up and started giving the greeting call. And I went to myself, this is really weird. They never do this unless their partner is present. And I looked out to see the birds flying everywhere. And I saw this bird, like nearly a kilometre away through my binoculars, flying in. And it landed beside my bird. And my whole perception of guillemots was changed after that. This bird had clearly seen its partner that looked like, to me like a speck and like every other guillemot and recognised it as an individual and it flew in, landed beside it and then they went through a greeting ceremony. It's the most fantastic paragraph. I quote it to, uh, in full in my book. Isn't that still recognition though, not love? It's very clever to be able no, to no, recognise them. Course, no, that's, see, but no, it's, no, you're absolutely it's just right. that's the skill they're doing, isn't it? Okay, that's, them. that's recognition. On another occasion... Uh, a female came back to her uh, breeding site, this was in Labrador, and she went. To, they breed in the same little spot year after year after year. She went back to the site and uh, she waited for a partner, no sign of him. After about a week, she thought, oh, stuff it, and paired with some other bloke who just turned up. <laughs> and her male had very distinct white feathers on his face. And one day I was sitting in the hide looking out to sea and I, could, I saw him on the sea amongst all these other guillemots, swimming fast into the colony. This is his return after the winter. And this is a colony where they hopped up onto the rocks. They didn't have to fly. And I watched him come up, and he hopped and hopped. And then he got halfway up, and he looked. And there's his mate with this other chap. And he just roared up and belted this other guy. And the, this <laughs> other guillemot kind of went, what? Oh, and ran off, never to be seen again. And then they went through the longest greeting ceremony oh. I've ever seen guillemots do. You know, normally it's about 10 or 15 seconds. This went on for two minutes. So tell and me, what do, you feel? what do you feel when you tell us? Well, it's what? lovely, but I, am I not putting on my, you know, human ideas about that and thinking it's lovely? No, what it tells us is that there is a lot more to these pair bonds that might involve emotions like love. I don't know whether it's love or not. But there's definitely something deep-rooted in those, those birds' brains that are causing this behaviour. And those are the little events that happen not very often in your career, and you think, that's what made it exciting. Mm. That's mm. what gave me inspiration. Like, that's what gave me lots of ideas about what's going on. Mm. I, I think this is incredibly important, because if you, if you can understand these creatures on something like their own terms, then they don't need to be treated as useless or disposable. You know, that's the virtue of this. I mean, it, yeah. it's charming, but it's also centrally important that if we can uh, you know, think differently about them, then maybe we will treat them differently. Yeah, maybe you can that's make people care about them. Exactly. It's about it, it inflating yeah. their value in people's minds. Yeah. And that these aren't just, you know, just dots on the cliff. There's something fantastic going on. And how have you found, uh, Tim, the writing process compared with the scientific process? Are you thinking very differently? I know you were saying, you know, you're obviously your day job is as an educator, so you're used to trying to explain things in a different... But how different is it when you're writing for mm -hmm. a popular audience? Uh, well, you obviously... I mean, as a scientist, you have to write clearly. But um, as, as a teacher, you have to explain things clearly to, to first-year and second-year students. So I just see it's, it's kind of part of that. Uh, process, but I love the the craftsmanship that goes with that, making sentences work and reading it to yourself and reading it out loud and going, oh, does this work? And then I try to I try to teach my undergraduates about how to write and how important it is to be able to write. Are they receptive clearly. to that? It's, it's hard work. Some of them are. Uh, there's some really interesting patterns. Um, girls that invariably better than boys at writing and I think that's because they invariably read more when they're younger 
But the, you know, I teach a course at third year level. I've just finished teaching it called History and Philosophy of Science, which sounds a bit pompous. It's about being a scientist. And you know, I tell them not to take notes. They just have to listen. That freaks them out. Can not take notes? How can we do that? And uh, I give them loads of stuff to read. And they've never really had to do a lot of reading. You bring a book out, yeah. and they look at it and go, a lot of pages in there. And <laughs> I see that as a challenge. I want them to get all the benefits that I've had from that wide reading and thinking. And you know, at the end of that course, quite a few of them go, I really got that. That mm. was just so different from anything else that we've been asked to do. And so for me, that's, that's kind of rewarded by academic career. And Adam, do you enjoy the writing process when it comes to that endless rewriting and looking at sentences again and again and again? And do, you probably do you just enjoy that? Drafted. No, I so don't. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've never written a book that is so in, involved with science as this one. Mm. And uh, translating the papers is a very interesting task. I can't do the statistics, and the statistics are absolutely core to what this is about. And so that there's sort of a great hole in the middle of my appreciation of it, and I feel that lack. So have you taught yourself to understand how to read the journal papers? Yes, I way? have. I have, and it took a while. But I can now. I now know how to fillet, get the filleting knife out. It's like that, isn't it? You just cut to the chase in it. Um, even for the scientists. Maybe even for the no, scientists. Yes, that. but I mean, I think it is interesting. You know, the, there's no doubt that imagination has a huge role in the doing of the science, but it's very different. Uh, from the kind of imagination that needs, you need to write something well. You know, the, the, to write something well like this, it is about fusing you know, sensory impressions, your actual experience on the ground, with the kind of analytical, rational things, and somehow making an integrated whole out of that. But scientific imagination is completely different. I think it's largely, to me, about knowing how to ask the question. It's actually, you know, that is, it's brilliant the way in which people have done this, to, to devise a question that can reveal a truth. It's something that in my world we, we never really do. We just get the stuff coming in. But you are digging into the world to get that new facts out of it. And it, that's very, very stimulating. Would you say that's what you're doing, devising testable questions, I guess. Yeah. Well, Adam's absolutely right. I mean, the, the key to being a successful scientist is identifying the right questions mm. and then um, finding ways to, to test your hypotheses. And that's where imagination really comes in because you've got to come up with some elegant, doable kind of test. It's all very well having hypotheses, but if they're not testable, you're wasting your time. Um, so I think you do need a, a, a good imagination for that. But I think, uh, just to go back to one of the points that you made, most scientists write in a scientific way, which is why you have to decode that stuff. And I, I just find that incredibly disappointing. You know, they think there's just one way of doing things. And it's, that's kind of a bit stultifying. Other scientists can read it, but you know, if you're not in that field... It's, you can it's, learn to read it. You can. But it is but, like learning Icelandic. Yeah. yeah. But that's, isn't that based on the tradition of how journal articles yes, have to be written. I mean, you, if, you, if you've if given they, in written like your book, will it, but will it get published if it's not? If I it's completely, if it's like your book? Um, yeah, I don't know. I've got a great project for you. When retirement, the terrible day comes, mm -hmm. set up a journal which has real yes. English as its medium. It's <laughs> a good idea. It's yeah. quite a good idea. Yeah. Well, I want, to, I want to throw things um, open to the audience now. I've got more things I want to ask, but do be thinking what you'd like to. Do we have roving mics? There's somebody just here and then somebody over there. Oh, and lots of people. Excellent. If you can wait a moment for the mics to come. Now you talk about science. Oh, you don't need one. <laughs> need an, yeah, you need if a you mic. can wait for the mic to, to come, that would be great. <coughs> You, you, Hello. You talk about science um, and the sheer water or the turn that circumnavigates the world. How much are, are scientists and the aerodynamic industries using this information? So uh, there's navigation, 
aerodynamics and energy conservation, how much is being used by industry itself? Um, good Can question. There's a very strong <laughs> move uh, in the last probably decade um, for the government really to only fund science or predominantly fund science that they think has some value, economic value. And that I know, it makes sense, but it kind of goes against the grain because a lot of the stuff that scientists do uh, will yield some kind of benefit, not, not all of it by any means, but you can never predict where and when. Now, whether um, people that design uh, drones or missiles could use any of the technology that seabirds use to navigate... I know one. Perhaps they do. I know one. Is they've just discovered that the upper surface of an albatross's or black back gull's wing, which is black, is 10% hotter than the undersurface, which is white. And so the air pressure on the top of the wing is less. And so it actually gives it thermal lift. lift. And now drones are having our black back gulls with engines. <laughs> Fantastic. That's interesting. Um, yeah. There was somebody uh, who was about in the second or third row just here who had a question just now. I had more a question about respecting and understanding them. Is it possible to get to the beyond what you already did? So we understand them, we comprehend that they exist, we want to try and make people understand that they experience something. What about moving beyond and seeing that they exist, so by a principle we should respect them because they coexist with us rather than us taking over. I think that's the whole point. I mean, that is what we're trying to do by making people interested and in, um, inspired by seabirds and other forms of wildlife. You're hoping that they're going to respect them more and might be prepared to make a bit of effort when it comes to conservation. So you're using that tactic yeah. in a way. But also, it, I think it is about this deep philosophical shift to not to think that the only way in which one can, for example, measure intelligence is whether it is quite like our intelligence. You know, whether there is a single spectrum, sort of anthropocentric spectrum of clever one end and not clever the other, so that, for example, crows and parrots behave quite like us to do with tools and, uh, and sort of behaving in a clever way like that. But there are other birds which don't behave in a clever way like we're clever, but are, for example, able to circumnavigate the globe you know, for five years without stopping and understanding uh, precious, you know, atmospheric pressure systems and so on. And so I think that, for me, the goal is to think that there are multiple forms of intelligent being of which we happen to be one, and our measure is not necessarily the measure. And I think that that is a great goal. And that relates to the kind of ecological niche that that particular species lives in. So shearwaters live in a particular niche where they have to migrate uh, to South America. And so their intelligence has evolved to allow them to do that. But we don't, you know. And that there is some crossover, in fact, between brain and body, that in fact, in some ways, the body embeds intelligence in a way that is not how most people think of, of intelligence. You know, that in fact it's the whole being that is intelligent, that is able to fly in difficult updrafts by a cliff or something. That too is a form of intelligence. Any more questions? Yes, there's one over here. Um, fascinating. Um, not a particularly scientific question, but are we still hoovering up sand eels in the Minch? And is there any hope that we'll stop hoovering up sand eels in the Minch? There's, there's no sand eel fishery in the Minch, and the sand eel fishery in the North Sea has, has largely come to an end. Uh, there's been a very good study done which shows that as long as one-third of the available fish or the expectable fish remain available, seabird populations are fine. And so there is an accommodation possible. It's if you go below the third, then seabird populations start to suffer. And so I, I don't think you need to, say, ban fishing if seabirds are to survive. I think there is a, there's a far more nuanced uh, solution available there. Having said that, of course, the seabirds in uh, 
most of the north of Scotland are in fairly serious decline and may be due to overfishing in the past, it may be due to climate change. One of the most striking things that's happened is that climate change has resulted in currents shifting where they actually go. So in many cases, the, the fish are now too far from the seabird colonies. Uh, instead of having to fly, you know, Gillamot having to fly 60 kilometres to collect a fish to feed its chick, if the food is now 100 kilometres away, that's just not economic. They can't fit it into the day to get enough food back to the chick. And that's why those populations are uh, in serious decline. I mean, really kind of heartbreaking stuff. They talk about emotions. There was one year um, when a colleague of mine was working on the Isle of May, and the, they knew that fish stocks were falling, but in this one particular year, Birds all laid eggs, they hatched the chicks, and then there just wasn't, there weren't enough fish to feed them. And the guillemots, who are normally incredibly social, get on with each other, help each other, suddenly just started throwing their neighbour's chicks over the cliff and stealing fish from anybody that came back. We were really horrific, and chicks were starving to death and dying on the ledges. The next year, the fish had come back a little bit, everything's back to normal. It's kind of very uh, emotive stuff when it goes badly wrong. Luckily on SCOMA, uh, while I've been there, that hasn't happened. But further north, that's happening pretty regularly. There's somebody over here who's got the mic. Hiya. Um, yeah, so you kind of just touched on the topic that I wanted to ask you about. I write about the link between the environment and food. And I was wondering, we talked a lot about the uh, decline in seabirds. And I wanted to know what you thought the number one decline was and whether that was overfishing and what singularly one person could do or, you know, is it the fact that we need to stop eating certain fish species or using plastics or mining what, oil? What can or an individual do? Well, well I mean, my, my take on this from what I've read is that the number one thing is global warming and the changes in the uh, ocean regimes that Tim was talking about. And so that undoubtedly addressing that question is, is core. Around the edge of it are uh, lots of other things to do with fishing techniques, with uh, birds being destroyed by gill nets, by long lining, uh, and also the destruction of their colonies by rats and cats and dogs and us. Uh, and so it needs to be a kind of you know, there needs to be a multi-front thing, which unfortunately is highly governmental. But I think the one thing that individuals can do is in relation to plastic, because it has been found that plastic that floats for even quite a short time in the sea starts to smell like food. And uh, nearly every seabird now has uh, plastic in its stomach. And so I think shut down on the plastic, don't throw the plastic away, recycle the plastic, don't get the 8 million tonnes that are currently going into the sea going in there anymore. That's quite a lot of things to do there. Anything <laughs> to add to those? No? The plastic is a horrendous threat. What happens is the birds think that it's some form of uh, invertebrate and pick it up because normally anything that smells like an invertebrate floating in the sea is worth eating, so they eat it, and then it fills the stomach, and then when they do find a real bit of food, there's not enough space for it to be digested properly, so a lot of these birds, particularly the chicks, are just starving to death. I mean, the the um, tiny plastic spheres that are in um, hand creams and cosmetics are particularly damaging because they get into the marine environment, clog up all the invertebrates, the little things that, have, that the fish would feed on, that the birds in turn would feed on. Um, so I think banning plastics and getting that <coughs> organised would be a major step forward. But I think more important than that is the climate change. Uh, more questions? Yes. Um, hello. I was just wondering, this is more directed uh, for Tim. Um, how have you seen the um, philosophical attitude or um, <coughs> respect toward non-human animals uh, develop or change in the scientific community? Just as a young scientist, <laughs> I've faced a bit of skepticism or even um, like not being taken seriously if I raise certain ethical or philosophical questions concerning... Okay, so that's an interesting okay. question, and it's a question that I have to deal with with uh, my two Ts, for example. A lot of students come to university to 
um, do something to do with conservation and are driven by the heart rather than the brain initially, which is absolutely fine. Um, but our aim uh, in terms of educating them and giving them a zoology degree is to get that balance right. You can't be totally unemotive about these things, but you do have to develop some scientific rigour so that you can put those emotions into the kind of right perspective um, so that it kind of works. There's somebody right, at the, right near the back, right up there. We haven't had many from the back. Hi, thanks. I guess I had a question related to the climate change, and, and oil's been mentioned a couple of times, but obviously maybe one of the solutions uh, to solve climate change would be to move to wind power. Um, I just wondered whether the panel had any comments about how we can balance um, offshore wind farms with coastal birds, because that's ultimately maybe a solution to climate change. But obviously, there might be local impacts, and just wondered if any thoughts on, the, on that. Well, it's the, it is one of the current great agonies that clearly to address climate uh, or global warming. I read some, someone the other day saying you shouldn't call it climate change. It's like calling World War II peace change. <laughs> so global warming uh, will be helped by uh, renewables. But there's no doubt that these uh, offshore farms are in the way of birds flyways and kill birds and will also disturb the whole regime by which they're living. And so it just has to be, you know, I think they have to be extremely carefully located. I think there is a big plan, very expensive plan, to have deep ocean floating wind farms, uh, which will be the far lower density of seabirds out there. And that might be one way of addressing it, of addressing it. But certainly the proposals for ones off the east coast of Scotland are really, really deleterious and uh, are a wrong way to go, I would say. Okay. Uh, yes, you have somebody back there, and then we'll come to the front here. Thank you. I have a question for Adam first. Um, with reference to your distinction between the anthropomorphism and uh, the sterile approach you referred earlier to your Cartesian uh, experiments, the one you quoted, uh, what do you make of the description of phenomena such as the duckling imprinting in Conrad Lawrence? Um, the King Solomon uh, ring book. Uh, is, it, is that still considered to be scientific enough? Or is it a good way of writing? Uh, or is it not? Or is it purely literature, scientific literature? How would you place that? Is it the third way, perhaps? Well, I think Lorenz's experiments were completely inspiring and have inspired generations of people. And, and you know, and Tinberg, and I think Tinberg is the first among them. And I, and I would say, rather going back to what we were saying earlier, that uh, if an experiment or if a way of treating an animal allows you to think of it as a kind of being with dignity, then that is a very good thing. I mean, a lot of science has been astonishingly cruel to animals, have you know, cut out eyes and, and severed connections in the brain and and so on and so forth. I mean, very, very coldly. I mean, these are out of old, you know, I don't think people do this kind of thing now. Uh, and I think that that moment of terror of anthropomorphism has luckily receded. And this, this third term of an allowable other form of consciousness or, or many, many other forms of consciousness uh, is, is, is making itself present in the scientific mind. And I, I think that's a fantastically civilised development. I think it's, it's, it's a very, very hope-inspiring uh, thing that, you know, that, that science can now start to attribute sort of meaning to the thoughts of other creatures is, is wonderful, I think. Uh, there was somebody in the front who's been patiently waiting. Thank you. Um, today's headlines about the penguins in Antarctica, that the chicks haven't survived, and so there's a whole generation gone. Can you say something about that, please? Oh, I? Yeah. Mm. At, one, at one level, it's not a disaster if it's just one year. <coughs> because seabirds are incredibly long-lived. Uh, they they've evolved. To, to be survivors, the, the adults. And so they can easily withstand, the populations can easily withstand losses like an entire year's worth of chicks. 
But I think what's happening in the Antarctic is if you plotted it out as a graph, it's year after year when the breeding success of these penguins is, is in decline. And that's what's really serious. So something like a guillemot lives, um, as I say, for about, and has a breeding life of about 25 years. It produces a chick. Um, well, about 85% of pairs produce a chick. And if you kind of do the sums, uh, what's happening on Skoma is enough to drive a kind of population increase. But you could have one bad year where no chicks are raised at all, and it would barely be detectable in terms of the population's subsequent trajectory because that's the way they've evolved, long and slow, in complete contrast to something like a blue tit, which is fast and short. You, know, you just breed for two years, produce 16 chicks in each year, and go for it. It's got the opposite ends of the kind of... Uh, ecological strategies that these birds adopt. And the one thing to say, to add to that, is that it doesn't matter if you don't have a, uh, a year of chicks, but it seriously matters if you destroy a lot of adults. Yeah. You know, that is where the damage comes. And that's what is happening you know, with long lining in the Southern Ocean and so on. And, so, and that is the thing that people should focus on. It's also what's happened in terms of climate change and storms. When you get a succession of storms like we did in the early part of 2014, storm after storm, the guillemots and other seabirds can't withstand that. You know, their body reserves are used up, and then you get what's called a wreck. You know, I forget what it was, a 50 to 100,000 birds found washed up, and then you can see the effect on the populations. Mm. Well, thank you for all those uh, great questions there and to the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Literature for putting uh, this evening's event together. Um, Adam and Tim will be um, signing their uh, books outside if you'd uh, like to um, talk to them further. Um, and um, it remains to thank them. Tim will be coming to finish off. But thank you very much, Tim Burkhead and Adam Nicholson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, really, from the Royal Society of Literature, we are tremendously grateful to the Royal Society for hosting this joint event with us each year. And, gosh, it's been a tremendous event tonight. I, I too, had long hair and was taken in the 1970s to sit on cliffs in Skoma, and I regret not having kept up my interest in and love of seabirds, but it's been very much revived by the right, right reading I've done from these writers and from tonight's discussion. And you've been wonderfully informative and entertaining, but I think it is above all your care for these birds that is very inspiring and I hope will inspire us to care more. And I absolutely hear your message that if there's any one thing we can do, it is going to be about what impact we can make as individuals on the environment, on our plastics, on our car use, on our global warming and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, thank you very, very much, Adam, Tim and Claudia for chairing beautifully. Thank you. Um, that, there will be book signing. I have just been asked to say what the next two events are, if I may, for both societies. Uh, so for the Royal Society, the next public event is here on Thursday, the 19th of October, the Roslyn Franklin Prize Lecture by Essie Viding on why do some people become psychopaths. The Royal Society of Literature's next event is why do some people become poets. Uh, no, it isn't. <laughs> it isn't in that... Um, or scientists, or pro. You know, uh, uh, no, our, our next event is at the British Library, which is our, uh, the home for most of our events. It's on the uh, 8th of November, and it is our annual event about short stories, where we have the winners of the V.S. Pritchett Prize for short story, and for short story, and they're going to be presented by and in discussion with that great short story writer Tessa Hadley. Please do join us for that. Um, I wonder if we could just allow our speakers off the stage so that they can go and be in the uh, ready-to-sign books so that you are more than welcome to continue the conversation with them, uh, but the deal is you have to buy a book to get it, so, uh, and so we should. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.